previously on the making of the mob Chicago. With Al Capone out of the picture, Frank Nitti, backed by Paul Rica and Tony Accardo, makes his first big move, shaking down Hollywood with street thug Willie Beoff. It's all there. Always a pleasure. But when Beoff gets busted, no names, no deal. Frank Nitti and uh, Paul Rica. Nitti is unwilling to take the fall. And Rica is put behind bars, leaving the entire empire in the hands of Tony Accardo. Looking to branch out, Accardo brings in up-and-coming gangster Sam Giancana. You ever hear of Eddie Jones? His racket's pulling in over a million a year. We can get in on it. I'll think about it. What the hell are you doing? I did what I had to. Nothing gets done without my approval. But knowing the policy racket could bring in millions, Accardo gives Giancana a second chance. I'm giving you something big here. Don't screw it up. yourself a favor. Start counting. By the mid-1950s, Chicago mobsters Tony Accardo and Paul Rica, who's recently been released from prison, have taken the reins of the criminal empire built by their mentor Al Capone. Accardo and Paul Rica were very, very, very close friends, and they were willing to share power, which you know, at that level of, of leadership, is very hard to find people willing to do that. Thanks to Sam Giancana's takeover of the policy racket, the gangsters are now making millions. But unlike their former boss, Accardo and Rica realize they have to be more discreet with their profits. The big change that I seen and I was taught from the El Capone days was the fact that we had to go underground. We had to go far, far underground. With so much money coming in, Accardo and Rica know they need a place to hide it. They find their answer in a growing city, located in the middle of America's Mojave Desert, where gambling is now legal. Las Vegas, Nevada. In the mid-50s, Las Vegas is a boom town, but the rules haven't been written. It is, in a sense, a frontier town. There is room to maneuver, and Las Vegans are very conscious that they need industry. They need business. Accardo and Rica see Las Vegas as the holy grail, offering a way to invest their illegal profits into a legitimate business. But they're not the first ones with this idea. The New York Mafia is already there, led by criminal mastermind Meyer Lansky. My grandfather in the early days of Las Vegas, the first advantage he saw is everything was legal here that they were doing illegal. There was nothing to hide. And uh, he saw it as a money opportunity. The New York mob runs the Flamingo, a luxury hotel and casino founded by Bugsy Siegel which is bringing in the modern-day equivalent of $50 million a year. And now, the Chicago Mafia wants in. If we do this right, millions. I like the sound of that. We just have to be smart about it. Do you trust this Lansky guy? He'll understand. And if he doesn't, we can do it your way. 
In a lot of ways, the Chicago outfit is as powerful as New York, and it may be more powerful. My Paul. When Luciano forms the commission, he's got the five families of New York. He's got the Buffalo mob. Well, the Chicago outfit is representing basically everything else. So they're taking in so much territory and so much action that they have a big say. So what can we do for you? We know Vegas has been good for you. We just want to make sure Chicago gets a piece of the action. <laughs> so you're uh, looking the muscle in on our rackets and you're telling us why? As a courtesy? No. We're telling you because we want to go in on this together. We have enough partners. None with access to our kind of cash. Look, gentlemen, it wasn't easy getting set up out here. Took a lot of time and a lot of effort. We understand that, which is why we want to work together. We put money into your casinos and cut you in on ours. Between your connections and our finances, this will be good for all of us. There's been a long standing peace between New York and Chicago. Who am I to challenge it? To peace. And money. With a partnership formed, the two criminal organizations set up a system to take full advantage of Las Vegas. First, to pay for the construction of new casinos. They secure legitimate loans from local banks who don't ask a lot of questions. Then, when the casinos are up and running, the mobsters use their legal profits to pay off the loans. And finally, they begin funneling their illegal money through the casinos. Las Vegas became a money laundering capital in the outfit uh took full advantage of the opportunity. Gambling was a cash business. So who notices if you suddenly say, oh, here's a dollar going here, I'll move it over here. As the operation grows, Accardo and Rika know they need someone on the ground. So Rika suggests his protege, Sam Giancana. I'm just not sure about him. He's proved himself with a policy wheel, no? He's made money. I've had to keep him on a short leash. How am I supposed to do that when he's 2,000 miles away? Just give him a chance. He's earned it. Besides, at least he'll be 2,000 miles away. <laughs> you have a point. Despite his personal reservations, Accardo knows Giancana's success in the Chicago policy rackets makes him the perfect choice to run the Vegas operation. Yes! Once again! Giancana and Las Vegas go together very well. He was the kind of guy who likes to hang out in casinos. He likes to be around the good-looking women and the action. Under Giancana's leadership, the outfit's presence in Vegas explodes as gangsters from Chicago move west. Chicago outfit became very dominant here in Las Vegas. You know, quite a few people from their outfit planted here, pit bosses, dealers, all kinds of, you know, on the ground working people, you might say. What are we working with here? But one mobster who's just arrived in Vegas catches Giancana's attention. The man who broke the mob's code of silence, sending Giancana's mentor to jail. And now, Giancana wants revenge.
Congratulations. While making his rounds in Vegas, Chicago gangster Sam Giancana spots a man from the outfit's past. Willie Beoff, the same man who ratted out Paul Rica and Frank Nitti 10 years ago and then disappeared. Willie Beoff does something that guys in the outfit don't traditionally do. He rolls, he testifies, and under his assumed name, moves to Arizona but can't stand to be out of the action, he comes up to Las Vegas, and that exposes him to organized crime. Hello? Yeah, you see? Yeah. Be off? Yeah. With my own eyes. Of all the places in the world, he chooses our casinos like nobody's watching. That prick needs to be taken care of now. Do you understand me? Yeah. I'll take care of it. One thousand three hundred and nineteen days. That's how long I went without seeing my family. Because that prick couldn't keep his mouth shut. Paul. It's done. November 4th, 1955, Willie Beoff is killed by a car bomb, the ultimate payback for ratting out his former partners. Tony Arcardo and Paul Rica, they were absolutely ruthless. They had both sides of that ability needed for that type of a lifestyle. You had to be able to inflict violence at some times, and you also had to be able to use your logic. But basically, when they walk through, they're going to be greeted immediately by lots of slot machines. This grand ballroom will be the biggest grand ballrooms in any casino in Vegas. Over the next two years, Chicago and New York launch an ambitious expansion of Vegas, transforming four miles of Nevada desert into what will come to be known as the Las Vegas Strip, attracting nearly 8 million people a year who pump over $200 million into the casinos. This is a beautiful ledger sheet. I want to frame it, put it on my wall. <laughs> and it's just the beginning. To the future, gentlemen. To the future. To the future. But Accardo and Giancana see Vegas as more than a destination for gambling. The magic that really made it take off was combining the casinos with entertainment from famous stars like Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin. Soon the allure of the Vegas Strip begins attracting Hollywood's biggest stars. 
and Sam Giancana takes advantage of all that the social scene has to offer. Sam Giancana is a guy who liked to hang out with celebrities like Frank Sinatra. Uh, he was a guy who liked to kind of rub shoulders with celebrities and with the powers that be. The way Sam was treated anywhere he went, they knew who he was, and he was admired. If a movie star came in the door with him, they would go to him before they would go to the movie star. As the money pours in, the outfit comes up with a way to make even more. It's known as the skim. The skim is money that's taken off the tables before it can be recorded in a book or anything to do with being taxed. How it worked depended on the place. They rig slot machines. They rig the scales. You get in the counting room, and the money starts disappearing. Very nice. Once it went into Vegas, they were bigger than anyone. You know, they were as big as the oil business. Just as the outfit's Vegas operations are taking off, an incident over 2,500 miles away in New York City threatens to destroy everything the mob has built. On May 2nd, 1957, New York mob boss Frank Costello is shot. But miraculously, he survives. As the gangster recovers, the police make an unexpected discovery. The police found a piece of paper that suggested that there was money coming out of the Tropicana in Las Vegas. There was skimming going on in the Tropicana Hotel. News of the cops' discovery spreads quickly, exposing the Mafia's ties to Las Vegas. This proved that an organized crime figure was involved with the casinos. This was very embarrassing for the local banks who were lending money to these people. So after that piece of paper was found, the local banks were not going to lend money to buy and build and expand casinos. How are we supposed to cover construction costs if we can't get a single loan? Not one. No bank will go near us. The banks will come around. When? Soon. Trust me. Until then, we just need to wait this out until it resolves itself. We can't afford to wait. If we can't get the money from the bank, we need to get it from somewhere else. To secure the financing they need, Tony Accardo turns to a source closer to home. I pledge to do everything in my power. To ensure a high-ranking officer in the country's largest labor union, the Teamsters. Jimmy Hoffa. I say I can look around this room and I can see a working man. Many working men. Nothing is more important to me 
than our financial security. Nothing. Thanks to the outfit's influence, Hoffa is now the president of the Teamsters Union, and Ricardo wants to call in a favor. That pension fund you started up, how much interest are you charging on loans? About 8%, but for you, I could get it down to six. Let's make it three. Three percent. Jimmy Hoffa was put in place and voted in from the Chicago outfit. So once he was in office for that favor, they needed loans. Three percent? Is that a problem? No. No problem. Whatever you need. The outfit took hundreds of millions of dollars from the Teamsters pension funds, which in essence was Ricardo's piggy bank. And that money is really what financed the growth of Las Vegas. But as the outfit's empire continues to grow, Ricardo and co-boss Paul Rica know they risk attracting more attention. Tony Accardo, he wasn't interested in being flashy and being noticed. Because then those, those kind of guys are always the ones who went to prison. To insulate themselves, the two mob kingpins make an unprecedented move by naming a new acting boss, a gangster who's made millions for the outfit and relishes the spotlight, Sam Giancana. You got big things coming, kid. And that's why we're talking to you. And we need somebody to run things. And you want that person to be me? Yes. But we need assurances you're going to stay in line. I will. Rika and Ricardo, their mentality was no heat. No Valentine's Massacre, none of that. So put a man named Sam Giancana in charge. They, they just sat quietly and they dictated what happened and recede even further in the background. Thank you. If you blow this for us, I know the consequences, Joe. Good. In one move, Accardo and Rica further distance themselves from the public eye, but retain the final say in all big decisions. For Giancana, taking day-to-day -day control of the outfit is a lifelong dream. Sam Giancana was, of course, a power crazy. He grew up the hard way. I mean, in other words, he stole and he robbed and all that, and then he became a big boss. But what he doesn't realize is that he's about to become the target of an ambitious young attorney who sees an opportunity to make a name for himself by going after organized crime. Robert F. Kennedy. these guys tracked down yes sir this is no joke gentlemen so if there's more resources that you need you come to me you let me know after successfully managing his older brother John's election to the US Senate Robert F Kennedy the seventh of nine children born to a growing political dynasty is ready to make a name for himself I don't think Bobby was bred to be a politician the older brothers were the future uh, politicians. Bobby was the one who ran the campaigns. Bobby was the one who kept everybody in line. And Bobby embraced that role.
What rate of interest did you charge on that loan? I don't remember. To further his career, Kennedy takes a position as the lead investigative counsel to the U.S. Senate, where he goes on a crusade against corrupt labor unions, targeting leaders like Jimmy Hoffa. Mr. Hoffa, you have people in Detroit, at least 15 who have police records. One of those has 38 arrests and is a known associate of Joe Accardo and Paul Rica, two of Chicago's leading gangsters. During the investigation, Kennedy uncovers a link between Hoffa and organized crime. Realizing that the corruption runs much deeper than the labor unions, Kennedy decides to use the power of his panel to investigate the mob. Kennedy, who's looking to make a name for himself, is going to see, wait a second, here's an opportunity, right, to, to use by righteous anger the black and white view of the world, good versus evil, for his own political purposes. One of the first men that Kennedy wants to call to the stand is the outfit's day-to-day -day boss, Sam Giancana. But when Giancana gets word that he's going to be subpoenaed, he does the unexpected and skips town. That was good to me. Well, Giancana played a lot of games, and among the games he played was avoiding service for the subpoena that would bring him before the McClellan Committee. For almost a year, Giancana stays one step ahead of the feds by hiding out in different cities and using a number of aliases. He was put in as the operating boss, the outfit, to mine the store, a multi-billion dollar enterprise. He's not minding the store. The goal is to bet as high as you possibly can. Sam Giancana? Yeah. You're a hard man to find. You've been served. It's about time. Despite knowing his bosses would disapprove, Giancana refuses to keep a low profile. So, what do you intend to say to the committee? Well, I would like to tell them to go to hell. <laughs> they couldn't catch me for a year. It was very fun. So what do you think of Bobby Kennedy? I think Robert Kennedy has no idea what he's in for. A number one rule for any mobster is you don't want to be in the press. It's, it's just bringing on way too much attention that the syndicate did not want. Anything he should be worried about? Guess we'll have to wait and see, won't we? <laughs> Take a walk. Now.
You're giving interviews to the Tribune now? Relax. Didn't say anything I wasn't supposed to. Shut up! I know what I'm doing Shut with you. Shut up! When you go in front of the committee, you're gonna take the fifth every single time. You got it? Yeah. I got it. Accardo never talked to the press, and it was frowned upon talking to the press. Why expose yourself? Why expose what you're doing? And I think they learned a lesson from Capone because Capone um, was more than happy to talk to the press. Clean yourself up. You're a mess. Quirk. On June 9, 1959, Sam Giancana, the acting boss of the country's largest criminal syndicate, arrives in Washington, D.C., ready to go head-to-head -head with one of the most feared interrogators in the country. After evading federal agents for a year, Sam Giancana is about to testify in front of a congressional committee and come face to face with the man determined to take down organized crime, Robert F. Kennedy. We ultimately subpoenaed him in Las Vegas. That is correct. Following that Las Vegas visit, he returned to Chicago, where he gave an interview to a reporter from the Chicago Tribune. You may relate what his opinion of the committee was. <clears throat> he says, referring to the committee, I would like to tell them to all go to hell. Is that correct? I decline to answer because I honestly believe my answer might tend to incriminate me. He also says, they couldn't catch me for a year. I like to hide. Is that correct, Mr. Gene Connor? I decline to answer because I honestly believe my answer might tend to incriminate me. He was also quoted when asked why he hadn't served in any armed forces during World War II, as stating, when I was called in front of the board, they asked me what kind of work I did. I told them, I steal for a living. They thought I was crazy, but I wasn't. I was telling the truth. <laughs> the authorities in Chicago consider Mr. Gene Connor to be the number two man in the syndicate in the city. He and Mr. Tony Accardo, number one, and number two. Is that correct, Mr. Gene Connor? When did they start asking questions, sir? Mr. Gene Connor? I declined to answer because I honestly believe my answer might tend to incriminate me. Would you tell us if you had opposition from anybody that you have them dealt with by stuffing them in a trunk? Is that what you do, Mr. Gene Connor? I decline to answer because I honestly believe my answer might tend to... Would you tell us anything about any of your operations or are you just going to giggle every time I ask you a question? I thought only little girls giggled, Mr. Gene Connor. When these guys like Bobby Kennedy and they got you in the crosshairs and they're questioning you like these committees they got... Would you tell us anything about any of your operations? And they're getting cocky with you. And you're just wishing you could come out of that chair and rip that son of a bitch right off that pedestal that he's sitting on over there. I declined to answer because I honestly believe my answer might tend to incriminate me. Is there anything further? You may stand aside, subject to being recalled. 
Every battle that Bobby Kennedy took up became personal. Everything was war for Bobby Kennedy. But Sam Giancana probably looked at Bobby Kennedy as just that, a rich, snot-nosed kid whose dad's fortune was made illegally. It's a publicity stunt. All Kennedy cares about is getting his name in the papers. And how exactly does laughing in his face help things? It was funny. Don't you ever think? You're on very thin ice. I knew blowing this whole thing out of proportion. Get out of here. Now. Giancana was too vocal, too out in the open. He wasn't underground enough. And I think it all went to his head after a while. To Tony Accardo, Sam Giancana has become a liability who now risks bringing the whole Chicago mob down. As Sam Giancana's outrageous behavior becomes more of a problem for the outfit. I got it. Don't worry. Co-boss Paul Rica knows he needs to rein his protege in. Listen, this business with you and Accardo, he's got a problem with me. I, I am living the life you and I dreamed of. Listen. And he's got listen. a problem with that. Does he even realize how much money I'm bringing in? What's it going to take to get respect? Listen, I don't... I am running the casinos. I, listen. I am running the policy. Listen! We got a good thing going on here. We do. And the only way that I'm going to be able to keep it like that is if you stay in line. Let me take care of Ocado, all right? Go back to doing what you do best. Make money. I don't want to see no more problems, okay? Of course. But in the midst of Accardo and Giancana's growing feud, Paul Rica is convicted of tax evasion and once again sent to prison. It's another blow to the outfit. But the government is just getting started. Who does that son of a bitch think he is? This is the man that's ordered the murder of dozens, maybe hundreds of men. And he just sits there, laughing like it's some kind of a joke. Kennedy was willing to go after the mob uh, by any means necessary, to use a phrase. With Bobby Kennedy, everything seemed to be personal. What do you want to do? I want to hit him where it hurts most. The casinos. Give me the Nevada Gaming Commission. Mr. Giancana, could you please come with us? What's this about? Please, I'm not going anywhere. Kindly escort Mr. Giancana off the floor. Get your hands off of me. I'm... Get your hands off of me! <sighs> After Sam Giancana makes a mockery of Robert F. Kennedy's hearings, 
the Nevada Gaming Control Board puts his name on a list of criminals who are barred from entering casinos. How the hell are you gonna run things in Vegas when you can't even step foot inside It's temporary, okay? I already spoke to our lawyers. They said there's a good chance I can get my name off that list if I take it to court. Take it to court? Have you lost your mind? What do you, you have any idea of the kind of press that will bring? What am I supposed to do? You fix it. I just told you how to fix it. Find another way. Otherwise, I'm gonna have to make some changes. <laughs> okay. Good luck with that. It's one thing to be a well-known gangster and to be hanging out with Frank Sinatra. But now to be seen, you know, as this criminal definitely makes life more difficult because it makes it harder to buy off the politicians, it makes it harder to buy off the cops, it makes it harder to basically run an operation if you have the, the media glare like this. Everyone's replaceable. Everyone! With Accardo and Giancana's relationship deteriorating, and Paul Rica in prison, the Chicago outfit is on the verge of a total collapse. On the season finale of The Making of the Mob Chicago, the 60-year saga of the Chicago outfit comes to an epic conclusion. There's enough business here for all of us without killing each other in the streets. And a decades-old rivalry threatens to destroy a criminal empire. What do you suppose we do? We sell things. Permanently. For more of the season finale of The Making of the Mob, go to amc.com.